Hello to everyone. Um, I see you all joining us. Uh, do, do bear with us. we have had a couple of technical hitches, but we are here. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming today. This is the final keynote for this year's Africa Week, and we're so excited. I think uh, we have outdone ourselves with what we're going to be able to, to share with you today, the conversation that we uh, are planning to have uh, this afternoon with you, or well, afternoon over here, uh, maybe a different time where you are. Um, so thanks so much for being with us uh, uh, today. Um, so we are going to be um, having this uh, keynote conversation that is titled Fashion as an Interlocutor Across Disciplines, Time and Spaces. And this is a conversation between uh, the renowned fashion designer Itwen Bassi um, and uh, ALCN Kings's um, Professor Fumi Olani Shaking uh, here with us. So I'm going to begin uh, by just offering a, a few introductory remarks um, about our speakers today. And then we're going to delve into our uh, conversation uh, this afternoon. So uh, first of all, um, Itwen Bassi is a fashion designer that has been based out of uh, Nigeria and uh, the UK uh, previously as well. Um, in terms of her, her work, of course, her work spans a range of creative um, uh, spaces um, from art projects, including here word theater productions, where she's worked very extensively on costume design uh, with, a, with a, a musical, Fela and the Kalakuta Queens, uh, Saru the Musical, For Colored Girls, uh, and Kakadu the Musical. Uh, her fashion design has been uh, very renowned across the continent, globally, I would say, uh, actually, and her work has featured in Vogue, Italia, British Vogue, Elle of South Africa, Marie Claire, South Africa, Cosmopolitan South Africa, Ebony in the US, a pride in the UK, and she's had runway shows, of course, in Lagos, Dakar, Milan, Paris, London, Vienna, Cape Town, um, and Johannesburg. She's also participated in trade shows in Florence, in Milan, um, in Milan, this was the PT uh, super talent with Vogue Italia. Um, and of course, she's no stranger to these spaces in terms of interactions with academic institutions. So we feel very honored to finally have her with us. She's participated previously uh, in discussions with the Harvard African Business Club, the Stanford Business Forum, um, and the Fashion Africa Conference in London. And by way of background, which is something we're going to be reflecting on today in, in our conversations, um, her training has been in theater arts at the Obatame um, Awolo University in Nigeria, which, is, uh, which was at the time the University of Ife, um, and also training in tailoring and clothing technology at the London College of Fashion here in the UK. Now our other speaker, um, is, is no stranger to many of us. It's Professor Fumi Olani Shaking, who is uh, here at King's, a vice president of global engagement and a professor of security leadership and development at King's. She's a founding member of the African Leadership Center, uh, where, of course, uh, I'm based and who's uh, um, uh, convening this session today, which aims to build the next generation of African scholars generating cutting edge knowledge for security and development in Africa. And she was also the director of the Conflict Security and Development Group here at King's uh, previously. And has a very illustrious career herself, having worked at the Office of the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict. And in 2015, she was appointed by the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon as one of seven members of the advisory group of experts on the review of the United Nations peace building uh, architecture. Um, many more illustrious accolades to indicate here. The final one I will note is that in 2018, the Director General of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, invited her to join the Council of the United Nations uh, University. So you can see we have brought you some amazing uh, speakers today, and I expect we're going to have um, an illuminating conversation this uh, afternoon. So um, what I want to begin with, actually, is, is this point on, uh, on education that we flagged uh, earlier. Um, and I wonder if we can begin 
with uh, Etwen Bassi. This, this um, uh, conversation about the role that education plays. I think since we are sitting here at King's and since this is a conversation at this institution, we'd be keen to hear first of all about, you know, how, how, you know, how your journey, how your education journey, what you studied, where you studied, has influenced um, uh, the work you've, you've gone on uh, to do. I say this also because at the back of my mind, the research project we are participating in, um, speaking to fashion designers in Nairobi and Lagos, has seen some very distinct patterns uh, around the place of higher education um, in terms of how it has influenced their work um, uh, as they've gone on to produce um, uh, uh, clothing um, and accessories as well. So very keen to hear from you about that, please. Um, hi, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. It's interesting listening to somebody speak about me in such glowing terms, but yeah. Um, so with um, regards to education and, um, and my journey so far, I, I really wonder, you know, sometimes if I would have turned out the way I have or things would have turned out the way they have if I hadn't gone through the either institutions that I went through. Um, um, yeah, but I, London College of Fashion, what did that do for me? Um, I started out, you know, with a mother who was a seamstress or, or did a lot of sewing. And um, so there was a lot of assumption on my part that, you know, this was something that people, young girls did naturally. And in fact, in my household, it wasn't just, you know, like young people, just the girls doing it. Um, I, I, I grew up knowing how to sew, knowing how to work with um, clothing and fabrics and things like that. So it was an assumption that I made that everybody knew how to do it. It was just, you know, just, you know, just get up and do. Um, along the way, um, taking on little jobs and taking on little assignments, I realized that there was a need for me to um, fully, totally understand it beyond just uh, something that I would have considered, you know, like a reflex or, you know, just something that, um, my, my mother knew how to do it, so therefore I know how to do it. I realized that it was something that I needed to have better grounding, more structure um, um, to understand that it wasn't just about coupling garments, but it was coupling garments with the with the need to or, or the the with the end in mind. Um, and so going to London College, in fact, going to London College of Fashion, because I had, had the option of doing a, a more creative pathway, but I opted for a more technical pathway because I decided that, you know, what I needed was the technical grounding as opposed to, you know, like the more creative um, um, way, if you, if you like. Um, going to University of Ife, studying theater arts, finding myself, you know, bailing, um, bailing productions out with just, you know, um, shared knowledge and things that I picked up from home and realizing that, you know, I could actually, you know, um, I, could, I could build on this, I could, I could work on this. And how that has helped, you know, especially with, um, with uh, my theater arts present, you know, like my, my work in the, in the creative or, or performance arts, is that, you know, like I find when producers or directors call on or call for our services, we tend to have a better understanding of what they might require because it's not just about putting garments, you're putting garments on stage that are actually speaking. Um, um, the garments become what you might consider non non-verbal non communication. So you put a rich person on stage without them having to say so in many words, the garments would have to say that. You also have to consider things like um, how fast can they get out of the garments and you know how quickly can they make changes and so on. And these are things that, you know, like education, my theater of arts education gave me great insight as to how the workings of that, what, <clears throat> what people would require, what did the, what the necessities would be in um, in a theater arts setting or a movie setting, for instance. And um, my education at London College of Fashion gave me the technical know-how 
of making those things happen. So it wasn't just about making a, a lovely looking dress. It was making things that would then transcend um, and, be, and be much more. So yeah, education, I, I would say is, is so paramount um, on, so many, on so many levels. Thank you so much for that. I think it's so intriguing to hear you talk about education in the way you did, but also the reference, the constant reference you made to education from the home. So beyond the formal space, but actually all the learning that went on from the work your mother did with you, um, from what you observed. So thinking about education beyond these hallowed halls, I think it's, it's so fascinating. And what you said also about the relevance of other arts to fashion itself. I think the, the you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to butcher your, you know, what you said in terms of uh, if I was going to go for a quote there, but what you said about clothes speaking on the stage because of your training in theater arts, I think is so, so fascinating. Um, and what, what this means for uh, education in the arts, the significance and the importance uh, of that. So if I can now come to uh, Professor Lonnie Shakin uh, on this, you know, in your role as a vice uh, principal here uh, at King's, and you know, some of the conversations that we're hearing go on around uh, a higher education uh, in the arts, uh, funding to that, some of the tensions there, as well. So I'm, I'm reflecting on the backdrop of some of the conversation we're having in the UK here um, around defunding arts education for a whole range of reasons, including uh, the fact that uh, some of those that work in those fields are perceived to not earn as much uh, as others. So that's just a backdrop to this, to this um, uh, to, in terms of reflecting the moment that we find ourselves in. What are some of your reflections on the importance of higher education in the arts um, at, at a moment like this and in uh, hearing what we've uh, um, had here from uh, Ishwan Basu. Thank you. You're muted, sorry. <laughs> Apologies for that. I, uh, I should know better. Eckhart, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. And I, you know, I think this conversation is timely in so many different ways. Um, uh, not least this question of where education might be going and what interdisciplinarity actually means, whether you're in the arts or the sciences. But, but let, 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 me, let me backtrack a little bit because I, I want to pay homage. I want to pay homage, uh, pay tribute in a significant way to it to embassy. Uh, because the academic that I am uh, today has, you know, it's grounding. I was made as an academic, uh, that thinks in, you know, in terms of multiple disciplines, things about problem solving, whether in my local or global environment, uh, through uh, not just, I won't even say multidisciplinary lens, uh, through, if you like, a transdisciplinary lens, because of the associations I had in the past. Uh, you said about Femi Aolo University, I was myself, uh, along with a uh, Tuembasi and uh, several of our colleagues at the time at Obafemi Aolo at a time when Tuembasi was setting the trend. Uh, I saw her uh, in theater arts. I saw her produce the costumes in theater arts, which the rest of us from different disciplines would go to, uh, to, to watch, would go to watch them at Ududua Hall, which is where, you know, uh, trademark auditorium was at the time. If there's any student, uh, uh, ex student of the, uh, any alumni of University of Ife listening, you know exactly where that is. And, and so uh, Ito Embassy, you know, blazed the trail by using uh, this costume she designed uh, as a student of theater arts. I remember you studied absurdity. Uh, you know, Russian theater was very important to you. I was a student of political science. And I sat in Ududua Hall just watching, if you like, rehearsal after rehearsal, play after play, see the kinds of messages, as she said, that those garments made, the political conversations that surrounded that theater and the costumes that she made. Uh, and without realizing it, that's why I had to go back there, without realizing it, I was sitting in the midst of, uh, you know, artists, very, some of the finest artists, uh, but I was sitting with them alongside economists, political scientists, scientists, and then we got to the UK, that trend uh, happened. 
my informal education, my informal uh, engagement with you know, interdisciplinary uh, uh, problem solving started without me realizing it until later years that I looked back and saw how uh, we approached, uh, we found solutions to so many different problems on campus in the UK here. In the midst of talking about socioeconomic conditions in Nigeria, uh, political, the political situation in West Africa at different times as a student uh, uh, at King's. Um, so working with Ito Mbasi and her colleagues uh, showed me firsthand how you could begin to put the arts um, next to politics, next to economics, next to um, other forms of social science uh, to form a movement. The movement that we build as West Africans responding to the situations back home. We're not, a, we're not it was, these movements were not from the lens of one single discipline. And so going back to the actual question that you asked me, when last July, I think it was last July that uh, uh, the, 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 the former education minister at the time, Gavin Williamson was you know, speaking gallantly about STEM and how uh, there was, you know, how there will be a de-emphasis on on if you like the arts and humanities, uh, because it's important to invest in uh, high cost subjects like science, technology, uh, engineering and mathematics, which uh, people would uh, call STEM. I, I, I too uh, thought, uh, you know, I was taken aback, but this has been a long time in coming in different conversations in Europe, in the UK here, uh, because STEM on its own, those STEM subjects on their own are not the things that make transformation happen, you know, wholesale in a society. It's because you're doing STEM and understanding it alongside, uh, you know, health, understanding it alongside the human condition. These things are responding to a human condition uh, in various ways in the, in the world, in the world around us, and looking at the social dimensions of that. So if we're talking about art, humanities, social sciences, and somehow we see them as something that sits aside from, from STEM, I think it's a fundamental cop-out uh, in society. In the 21st century, when we've just been visited by COVID and all of the related challenges, look at how uh, we're seeing the human, uh, you know, the hum humanities and the social dimensions of COVID speak out to us much more. It doesn't matter how much you vaccinate people, uh, all right? Or, or how much you ask people to be vaccinated. If you do not understand the conditions that surround, you know, uh, the choices that they make about vaccination or not, and you can talk about a dozen of, a dozen other science related or, you know, science and health related things and realize that the, the arts have to be at the core of that. And it's not about thinking about the arts in separate ways because you're thinking about how uh, revenue generating in theaters uh, might dwindle during COVID or how if you don't build careers in those areas, uh, you are killing a particular uh, part of society. But it's about the accompaniment of the arts alongside science and technology without that accompaniment. The inter interpretation of all of those things will require the arts to do it. The human dimensions of those things require that arts and humanities and the social sciences and the social sits at the, at the center of it. It's not one without the other. Uh, and I, I, I saw it to Mbasi at work. I did, don't want to preempt her. But look at those masks that were made during COVID with these sorts of fabrics, which you know in themselves tell a story. Look at how they were given. A look at the social work that surrounded the creations uh, of Ito Embassy uh, in the time of COVID, and that still that still goes on because this is not a post-COVID environment. And then you begin to see the folly in separating, uh, in achieving a clear-cut separation uh, of <laughs> of the arts you know, from, uh, from science and technology. I could go on and on, but uh, this is a subject that I think you and I have discussed in different ways uh, before now, uh, Eka. Thank you so much for that. I mean, that's, that's so fascinating, the responses and the um, interactions, actually, intersections across what both of you have just said. I want to take this theme a, a little further. We've reflected immensely on 
interdisciplinarity. And I'm keen to hear um, from Tombasi now, perhaps about the influence of history. How do you see your work in conversation uh, with history, right? So I know you, you've done you've done some uh, some work in terms of uh, in the theater space, um, some recent work uh, chronicling uh, the life of Fumilayo Ransom Kuti. You supported some of that, uh, for instance, as well. You speak a lot of your, uh, about your mother and the influence that space has also had on you, and I guess her her times, her period. So you know how how important has all of that been uh, for you know for where you find yourself now, um, and for how you continue to do your work. And uh, alongside that, I mean, I wouldn't say at another end, how important is thinking about the future as well in your work? In, in what way do you connect the fashion space to thinking about futures in, in thinking about the future um, in Africa? Um, so for me, history, hi, well, for me, history has never really been something that I, I would think of as now we're going into history or now it's, it's been just a part of who I am and, and um, a part of my story. I think, you know, like, um, I, I don't think it, it has uh, its, its roots in theater, but I am a storyteller. I, I think, you know, like most Africans are storytellers, you know, we, we tell stories one way or the other. And, you know, like I just find my expression of it um, through fashion. And so, um, so I'll, I'll take, for instance, my, um, a collection that we had called the independence so that was when nigeria was celebrating its uh, 50th anniversary um we had made clothes you know we've done other collections before but that, that that particular collection i remember thinking to myself i wanted to do something that would pay um homage to my my father have, having been um having been the person who um conducted the independence uh day parade of uh, Nigeria so it was a big thing for me and it was a big thing for my family you know it might not have been a big thing for the people but for us it was a really um, a major thing at the time I was thinking it I was thinking about it for myself and my family I wasn't thinking it I wasn't thinking about it um, retrospectively or thinking about it as history so but what did that how did that play out? It played out that, you know, like I was looking back, I had to, I went back and researched, you know, what were people wearing at the, at the, at the, at Nigeria's independence? Um, how did women express themselves, you know, through fashion? Um, what were the kinds of things that they referred to? What were the kinds of things that were important? What were the kinds of things that were trending at the time? And, um, and so we, we, we did a collection called um, Independence that, that was a, a look back at what you know was happening at the time of course we made it more contemporary of course we made it you know more relevant to today and um and it was it for me it it was wonderful it was a, a wonderful way of telling um telling our story of uh, presenting our history from an interesting point for you know some you know, they're not used. To, I don't think everybody would want to read about the history of Nigeria purely from a textbook or from a, a point of, you know, I'm just reading to recount these dates and to recount these things that happened. But you know, like to actually look at it through the lens of um, something creative and something, um, quote unquote, fun, um, was something that you know was was really uh, important um, to us. And I think, you know, like uh, some of the young people that were interning with me at the time who had not really embraced, because um, there was a point where history was taken out of our curriculum here in Nigeria um, for so many reasons. Um, and so, you know, like the people that, you know, the first time they were coming across what this aspect of this part of the history of the history was when we did it in fashion. So I thought that was, you know, that was phenomenal. And um, I also like the fact that it, it pushed people to then start researching, research, you know, um, um, fashion ideas or research, you know, like collection ideas through back to what where, where we were before, what we had before and why that worked or did not work. You know, it's, it's impacted so many things and so many ways. Um, that we've done, you know, like there's a trend now where people are going back to look at the original um, 
um, fabrics and textiles that we had used in the past, you know, like, the, like our, our grandparents, our ancestors, you know, people had used, why did they stop using them? Where did they come from? How, how have those things evolved? And, you know, like, I, I, I find that, you know, like, particularly interesting and, you know, like, interesting that um, you look at that and you see how that is impacting us now. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a whole buzz right now about um, sustainability and, you know, um, I, I, and, and ways on recycling and you reusing and all those kinds of things. And when you look at, you know, like um, the, way, the way I grew up, recycling things was not, um, it wasn't a buzzword. It wasn't something that we did. Um, we did as a way of, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing. We recycled because it was everybody recycled. You know, you couldn't buy things that you know had only one use or one you know, and then you throw it away. When you bought clothes, you bought clothes for children because you knew that they were going to hand it over to their next, you know, the the younger ones and younger ones until the things were completely threadbare. You know, on things until so you you you'd buy a, a pot it would become you know a bucket for tomorrow, it would become something, you know, the uses changed until those things were no longer, you know, like usable. You know, you'd, you're, you would you'd not buy, you would not use bed sheets, for instance, that would end the lives because oh, it got burnt in this corner. If it got burnt in that corner, you'd cut it out, you'd use it until it became a rag, it became a, a duster, it became, so, everything just continued evolving and becoming other things so when you know like so when i see um um when i look when when i think of history that's you know it 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 does that for me you know like what were what did my parents how did my parents do it how did their parents do it what are we doing now and what would my children do what my grandchildren do you know how have those things continued to morph and continued to evolve to become other things um and, and for me, that's that's amazing. When we worked with them um, on the FRK production, which is you know like it's not yet out, that forced us to not just look at um, not just look at the not just look at the, the life of this Fumilaya Ransom Kuti from a point where we were gifted, you know, like the information. But we had we were now forced to go delve in to go and find out more. We had to do a lot more research than what was easily and readily available. And the amount of insight it gave, you know, and then you can, you know, you can kind of look back and think, you know, before, before we had the Sorosoke movement, this woman was doing Sorosoke. Before we had this women empowerment, this was happening back, you know, back, right? We were doing it, you know, we were doing it. Um, and so history in a sense repeats itself if we do not take the good from the bad and and build on the good and you know so the, the importance of history in fashion is you know cannot be cannot be discounted cannot be discounted and you know like and for us we you know like we've always just done it quite a, like a, a natural evolution you know we we continue to build we continue you know we did the co collection and you know like got people talking about it got people asking you know what was your what what role did your father play that forced us to understand a little bit more about why he did why what he did who he was and so on and it just gives you it gives you um avenues for discussions avenues for um um recollections you know i have to speak to my mother about where this fabric came from why this fabric was used the way it was could it have been used differently can we then use it differently so yeah Thank you so much for that. I mean, I love what you're saying about challenging how we think about time, how we think about the passage of time, how we think about history, history being with us. And in a way, I think many people, you know, reflect on how some African spaces, I don't want to generalize now, but certainly those I'm familiar with, problematize the idea of time as linear, right? How the present is with us, the history is with us as well, and the future is with us. You think of how a lot of Africans interact with the notions of their ancestors, you know, pouring libation, all of that is present. We are living uh, in moments where ancestors are present with us and all this 
actions we take to show that, to reflect that, to actually um, uh, interact with, with those ancestors. I think that is so, uh, uh, that is hugely, hugely uh, uh, valuable in terms of what you're sharing with us and how actually fashion essentially provides us with a different way or a different narrative uh, around history. And I think this is so critical for when we think about, you know, certainly I think of Nigerian spaces, but many other spaces on the African continent where there's a very problematic relationship with history, histories that have been told by many others, histories that I think many of us would agree um, have been, um, uh, you know, tilted to sort of present African spaces in a less than flattering uh, light. So the desperation, the need to have other narratives that Africans themselves are able to pursue um, around their own histories. A lot of what you're highlighting that fashion has provided a space uh, to do. So it's really right. fantastic um, uh, to, to hear that. And I want to move now to, to Professor Lonnie Shacking and perhaps to, to hear from you uh, around this, again, this narrative uh, um, uh, on the interaction between the arts and, and history, the extent to which this might provide us a space for different uh, narratives about, about uh, our histories on our histories. You know, I like what you're saying about the diversity of those histories as well. So different spaces for different narratives uh, around histories um, in Africa. What are some of your reflections on that? And thinking about the arts, fashion, but more broadly, we can think of what literature has to say about that, you know, whole range of, of, of reflections, the poetry as well, for instance. Thank you. You're muted, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this time around, I became a bit more conscious of it. Thank you, thanks, Eka. I've just been really fascinated um, listening to uh, Ito Mbasi, and she has connected so many dots uh, with, um, you know, in that last part of the conversation. And as she talks about continuity, my goodness, it, you know, she's taken different things. It's that point about sustainability, that point about returning. Um, the first thing I just put straight on the table was a question of identity, African identity. And, and so there's continuity and there's change. It's what I love about history. There's continuity and there's change. The way our histories were, re, you know, are being rewritten. The way our history is being rewritten, and I want to speak very general in a general sense about Africa. Um, and I actually see, uh, you know, I see what is, you know, what we're seeing on the screen and seeing how there's something about what it embassy does that, you know, lays bare our own identity and the different conversations we're having, even with fashion, between fashion, between fashion and music, between fashion and other aspects of culture. And if we went back uh, to the same independent, uh, independence year that, uh, you know, uh, independence, early independence uh, years that Etoen was talking about, I'm not sure that we had this kind of self-confidence. If you look at some of the photos, uh, Africans were dressing more like the colonialists. Africans like us, middle-class educated Africans were aligning themselves more with the colonial images. I would have, I would have seen more uh, of men in their suits, ties, uh, in hot, you know, in the hot African sun, even in bowler hats, all right? sweating profusely, but needed to look like Englishmen or Frenchmen. Uh, you saw different uh, variations of it uh, with our parents, those whose parents were either uh, you know, outside of Africa or even within Africa. And I'm talking specifically about the middle class, those of us, uh, you know, so-called middle class who had some form of education, university education. There's something about how, uh, Africa is more, uh, and Africans are more self-confident now because these things you see on the street would also be worn on the streets of London, very proud, you know, with pride. They're also now being worn by non-Africans, all right? So, so you can begin to tell, where, where, so you see some of the continuity, no doubt, but you see change as well in how Africa is placing itself uh, in a global context, in how fashion is speaking back, look at the helmet, what has been done with the helmet in what we're seeing, that is speaking back to the social issues of our times, 
don't get on that motorbike without a helmet. Uh, but actually you're made, you're looking really nice and being encouraged to wear that, um, all right, even as you make yourself safe. I, and some of that change is what I want to talk about, about how we use how in the African environment at the moment. This Africa week, you spoke yesterday, or one of the keynotes yesterday was um, with Nancy Ademora, uh, all right, um, and uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, and uh, uh, she would, you know, we were having that conversation and you're seeing how young Africans are embracing aspects of the African culture uh, through the fashion, through the music, through the writing, and therefore occupying a continental and global stage. You see how it embraces fashion, uh, and no doubt other you know, fashion designers as well, but we're here talking about Ituembasi and her fashion we see in front of us, speaks, uh, you know, to the film. It's, you know, uh, aligns with film and music and sends a particularly strong narrative about Africa. And I would dare say that if not, um, if not for this African artist, all right, Africa's place in the world will not be as self-confident because when you look at African politics, the questions of peace and security, our economy in that sense, we lag behind, all right? On some things we really, really uh, make an impact on the world in spite of the very tenuous political spaces, in, in spite of the tenuous peace and security sp uh, spaces. This is what is different about now compared to then, if you look, um, if you look historically. Uh, and one more thing, you did this piece of research, uh, I think with um, uh, Roberta uh, and, and other colleagues, look at what this industry uh, is saying. If you take the fashion industry and you actually take our theater in terms of Nollywood and the other, you know, um, you, you know and, and the other works across the African continent, this is in spite of our governments, in spite of those places that are not putting resources behind these things. But I want to speak to Africa and China before I keep quiet. Um, part of what I see designers like Hito Embassy doing, and she probably will end up speaking to this, is saying, let's make our own fabrics. Mm. Let's partner with China differently. Let's use our own traditional, you know, um, you know, our own cultural context, our own traditional approaches to begin to change and have a conversation with the global, with the national economy and the global economy. So you find this, this lot of Africans dynamic, having a conversation with, with the global superpower, uh, emerging superpower now, that our governments cannot have. And so in the end, I, I see them as bridge builders. If you look across history, this is the most confident that ordinary Africans have been, and they're using their own expert power and their soft power, using their skills and using what it is in the African uh, environment naturally to speak back to the governments and the and the patterns of those governments in negotiating, you know, with super, you know, with great powers abroad. This has to be tapped into. I, I don't think, you know, I don't think we have made more. We need to make more out of this. Uh, than we could. So when it comes to manufacturing, enabling this to really happen in country, use the resources of the country, uh, use, you know, use that for employment, uh, then it means the government has to back this up in other ways and have a different kind of arrangement, all right? With your Chinas, with any other, um, you know, governments that will be trading with, with Africa. So, so I, I think it's a really, it's a fascinating moment. And if we look uh, historically, uh, I acknowledge the continuity, but I think the change, all right? And especially the positive aspects of the change that I see uh, before me is a, is a self-confident Africa uh, as a result of the two embassies. Thank you so much for that. I think that was incredible because you also brought us back to the conversation about futures, about the present, the contemporary period, so you spoke about those continuities, but the change that is going on. Um, and you know, this reflection on, on what does fashion allow us to say, how do they allow us to reflect or the arts in general about futures. This increasingly more confident um, Africa is what I'm hearing you speak about and how that is beyond, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of the, the 
state or those who occupy positions of, of power in that sense, but how this is more diffused. And I think that's a hugely important conversation, but also you bring to us that point about Africa in the global space. So continuing a conversation we're having yesterday evening with some of our um, uh, uh, alumni who are really influencing literary spaces, this global Africa uh, idea. So again, that is linking us into those continuity, but also changes, Africa's place in the world. And then a, a subject very close to my own heart, the, the point about making, about producing, uh, about the extent to which we can invoke uh, uh, certain forms of foreign capital that are increasingly available to us, you highlighted China there. And also this conversation about how, you know, we build linkages within our economies, how we make those economies uh, uh, even more self-sustaining, how we use uh, local inputs to produce higher value uh, goods. That's something anyone who knows me will not very obsessed with, the, with these sorts of conversations, but let me not dominate this space. Uh, with some of that. I've invited questions from our, our colleagues. Please, please uh, step in. We have about 10 minutes uh, to go, but I want to squeeze in every minute we, we have of this. While I wait for those questions to come in, I wonder if I can put a final uh, a point to you while those questions are, are coming in. And, and it's to carry on this conversation about uh, Africa's place uh, in the world. So something I want to turn to uh, it to Ambassador around here is ask you a start question. And this is always, a, a, we had this conversation I said with our, our author yesterday, thinking about whether a person is a Nigerian artist or an African artist or just an artist who is African, just an artist who is uh, Nigerian. Um, this conversation we have about being African um, uh, in the world, also about how, how work is identified. Uh, what labels are you happy with or not happy with? Uh, wh what do you feel shackled to or want to be unshackled from? Uh, basically, let me tease out my question there again. Do you identify uh, as a Nigerian or an African artist? Do you think these labels are helpful or useful or not? Um, I think you, I think the labels can be used to your advantage if you want if you want them to. Um, but for myself personally, it was something that I struggled with earlier on. Um, earlier on, when you know, like the awards started coming in, you know. What, what does it mean to be a Nigerian designer? What does it mean to be an African designer? Who is an African designer? Are you an African designer because you work with African fabrics or your expression is, you know, you, know, you have a lot of masks and things like that? Or are you an African designer because you, of your heritage, you, know, you happen to be an African, by, you know, um, what makes you an African designer? And I think, you know, like for me, what works comfortably is that I am a designer I am African, I am Nigerian, and however you want to mix it, it's, you know, it's, it's up to the person um, to mix. I, however, have a very strong African, um, on, uh, African and Nigerian expression of my creativity. So if that makes me African, then so be it. You know, if that makes me an African designer, so be it. It's, um, I'm a person with a certain way of seeing things. I have a certain way of saying things. I have a certain way of expressing things. And those things have been influenced by obviously where I have grown up and the things that I have found attractive or that, uh, that you know, have either been um, things that have been attracted to me or things that I've been attracted to. Um, so I, I cannot help be who, the, be who I am. And so therefore I do express, you know, um, my creativity and my fashion expression, whatever name you want to call it, I express it with a very strong African and Nigerian accent. You know, I, I, I liked what um, um, Fumi said earlier about, you know, the confident Africa and, you know, like that, you know, it, uh, that's one thing I'm going to take away from this. You know, I've, you, you, you kind of do it without really thinking about Africa as confident and, and you know, um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's something that we call, you know, like we do that we could say unapologetically, unapologetically Nigerian. You know, I don't have to apologize about it. I don't have to explain it. I just happen to be it. And, you know, and that's, and that's how, we, how it is. Um, and, and going away with this sense or this renewed sense of um, uh, confident Africa is just something that I, I think it's just, you know, phenomenal because you, you do it and not because you express it 
not because you want to be um, applauded for it. It just happens to be who you are. Sometimes I find it a little, maybe somewhat patronizing when, you know, it's like, yeah, that's good for Africa. It's, you know, you know for me, that's not good enough. Um, African, I have an African accent and that's how, that's how it goes. I, I, I'd like to take my space. I like to take my space with all of my expressions totally intact. Um, I don't need to be applauded for being African. I don't need to be recognized for being African. I don't need to, you know, I don't, I don't need the, those things. I am that in the same way that somebody else might not be that. So if the work is good, the work is good, not because it's African. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is, you know, really, really, um, you know, incredible to hear. I like also how you're connecting the various uh, elements of what we've uh, spoken about uh, here uh, today. Um, I'm keen now. I'm waiting for questions. I'm not okay. I'm having wonderful comments. Uh, people are very happy with what they're seeing, and the visuals have been amazing. So thank you so much, Itembasi, for sharing those. You know, me, as I said, keen to squeeze every second. Uh, of this. And so if I can come perhaps finally now to, to Professor Lani Shaku. So just reflect, I mean, here, and we, we, we got this reprimand, if you like, yesterday um, as well, that we speak of uh, African spaces, but there is a dominance of particular actors in this African uh, space. Uh, you will not be surprised to hear the culprits here uh, that were painted yesterday were Nigerians. How how do we navigate and negotiate this? How do, you know, what do you think about arguments that suggest, you know, there's a need to make space for others? So while we talk about Africans, there are certain dominant actors, uh, you know, by sheer weight, by strength of economy, um, uh, by, yeah, uh, uh, population, a whole range of factors. What can we do to be having conversations around the arts, but more broadly, um, uh, around sort of a, a continental arrangements that are, um, uh, more inclusive of a whole range of African actors. What are some of your reflections? Thanks, Eka. I imagine that's for me. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, first and foremost, this thing of a confident Africa, I believe in it firmly because had it not been for African people, peoples and their talents and their creativity, we would have been just dumped somewhere, you know, that entire continent, continent with its 1.2 billion or so people would have been long forgotten uh, or condemned to a place of just always being seen in conflict terms, war and poverty terms. Not because those things don't exist, but they don't always say, they don't exist only in Africa, right? War, yeah. poverty, destitution, the, it's not the, you know, it, 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 it's not the preserve of Africa alone. It exists all over the world, even in this country where King's College London is based. And so therefore, when it comes to Africa, a different story, that is the complete story of Africa has to be told. If not for the kind of talent that you see on this screen now, the kind of expressions through music, through poetry, through all forms of art, um, Africa will be long forgotten and condemned somewhere, all right? So that confidence though, is it well spread out in Africa? Uh, what is it? It said that to whom much is given, much is expected. All right. So you take the most populous countries in the world. Uh, you therefore, if you look at Asia, you pick China and India very quickly. You look at Africa. You have to look towards Nigeria. And I have to say, uh, I've I've become also quite comfortable with the idea that if we we have this many Nigerians in the world and in Africa they will have some of the finest, most talented people, some of the wealthiest people. They will also have, you know, some of the most, you know, uh, you know, not so talented people, let me be kind, and also some of the poorest people in large numbers. All right, is what I mean. And so leadership is bestowed on a country like that by sheer force of its population and what it has. What do you do with that leadership though? I mean, each one has just identified herself as African, Nigerian, all of that, and she happens to be a designer, one of the finest in the world for that matter. That's what we should say of any African, wherever they are, 
but to be the best that you can be, to also be able to occupy a stage requires that you take others along with you. And that's why the African Leadership Center, its own virtues and values are about that for all Africans, regardless, whether you're in Nigeria, yes, take those multiple talents and pull others up. Be in the company of the finest and be deliberate about the diversity you're creating because you have that strength. And I, I mean, it's what I would say uh, for Nigeria is what I would say for Ethiopia, uh, is what I'll say for uh, the DRC, South Africa, you know, just look at some of the most populous countries, but they do, they're not equally talented. Some are so ravaged by war. Nigeria itself that we're talking about is not without, you know, its own war or its own walls. But it's in, the, it's in that same space that this kind of talent, all right, abides and it abounds. So let's make use of it for the continent of Africa. I'm very comfortable uh, understanding that I have multiple identities and those multiple identities, I would express some of them depending on, on where I stand, all right? But without a doubt, uh, the collective African message the collective African voice must be enhanced by, you know, the most popular states, the wealthiest states, the most talented states. And so I think we can do more. I think others, by the way, also should embrace Nigeria. It's not just one form, it's found in different forms. And I know that sometimes when we have that conversation tongue in cheek, uh, Nigerians are seen a particular way, very vocal, uh, maybe even loud. But what I want to conclude with Eka is that, Africa's voice has to be heard loudly on the global stage. And it is these kinds of talents through Nigeria, through the countries where those talents uh, are in abundance that will help Africa occupy its space in the world. I want to see Africa in a global context. I want to see all of this uh, you know, talent that we're expressing here in a global context. It shouldn't be about Africa having, you know, receiving wisdom all the time from the rest of the world, but we're not giving back that wisdom, that talent. We need to occupy a fair amount of space in order to do that and speak back to the rest of the world through all of the talents. And actually, first and foremost, we will then use these talents and what we can do collectively to speak back to the governments of Africa because they do not represent Africa uh, only. This that we see here, that is Africa in its finest. We need to use this to influence those who lead Africa, uh, sometimes almost leading them astray, but whichever way they will lead Africa, if there's mutuality in it, let the people who create this talent, the two embassies of this world, bring that talent to bear collectively with all of us in academia as well, to really speak back to the states of Africa, but to the rest of the world. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so, so very much. I think, you know, a resounding a success in terms of a response and in terms of bringing us uh, to the end of this. I see a question that came here just uh, at, the, at the end of the hour. So my apologies that we're, we're not going to be able to address that just now for, for time, uh, timing purposes, forgive me for that. But I have your question and note here and we'll uh, aim to get back to you and respond to that question um, uh, very directly. It's left for me to say a huge thank you to all, uh, all of those that have joined us here uh, today. Thank you so much for being to us. Um, uh, to Professor Lonnie Shakin, thank you so much uh, uh, for spending time here with us and for those incredibly rich and insightful comments. To Itwen Bassi, uh, uh, definitely the star of, of, of uh, uh, the, the show today. Uh, thank you for these incredible visuals that really allow us to look beyond our imagination and, and, and reflect on, on what you have uh, achieved through the years. Thank you so much uh, for taking time out of a hugely busy schedule uh, to be with us, to share your wisdom and your knowledge um, on this and a range of subjects, and really to speak to the heart of Africa Week uh, around how the arts and cultural production allow us to think about a range of disciplinary areas and themes that may not immediately uh, come to mind. I want to also appreciate the sort of decolonial way of thinking about education. I really, I think I'm gonna take with me that reference to education in the home space. Uh, speaking a lot about your mom's 
that reference there, I really, that travels when you talk about education and miseducation. Uh, I think that it's really, really important to be able to carry that with us today. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to everyone. Um, uh, later this afternoon, we are going to be having a Meet the Photographer event um, and a reception uh, to close off uh, Africa Week. Thank you so much to all of you that traveled with us through this week. We will be here again um, in the coming academic year. Um, I wish you very, very well um, and, you know, safe paths as, as you move on. Thank you so much and, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eka. Thanks. Thank you.